Okay, let's get started. Good evening and thank you for joining us for this virtual community lecture focusing on men's health. I'm Daniel Vela and I'm one of the managers here at Providence Little Company in Torrance. We are joined by expert urologist, Dr. Faisal Ahmed. Before we get started, I want to let everyone know that, that this is an hour long presentation and we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please use the Q&A box to type in any questions you have throughout the event and we will do our very best to get to each question at the end of the presentations. We will not be opening it up for attendees to speak on this webinar. Before I introduce our first speaker for this evening, I wanted to share that Province Little Company Mary offers a complete spectrum of mental health services. We are devoted to helping men address their medical needs at every stage of life through preventative care tips for a healthier lifestyle and advanced treatment for illness and disease. These services range from cardiovascular surgery to neurosurgery to urology, which we are discussing this evening. For more information about these services, please visit, visit the URL in the chat box. Lastly, I want our attendees to know that the information provided during this program is for educational purposes only. You should always consult your healthcare provider if you have any questions regarding a medical condition or treatment. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed is a board certified urologist at Providence Little Company Mary Medical Centers, San Pedro and Torrance. As a urologist, Dr. Ahmed helps people with disorders of urinary tract. He treats benign conditions like kidney stones, enlarged prostates, and incontinence. In addition, he helps with cancers of the kidney, bladder, and prostate. Dr. Ahmed chose to work at Providence Little Company Mary because he always puts the patient first and allows him to offer his patients top-notch high-quality care from pre-surgery to post-operative care. Dr. Ahmed loves coming to work knowing that he is going to make a difference in every patient's life. A fun fact about Dr. Ahmed is he knows all the lyrics to the full 14 minute version of Rapper Delight. And if we have any extra time at the end, we'll put that to the test. Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate the opportunity and thanks for everyone who's logged in. Let me get my screen shared with you guys. I have a little presentation here that will run through the basics of BPH or prostate enlargement and hopefully generate a good amount of questions for the end of the talk. I apologize if I'm speaking to stuff people already know here in the chat, but we're gonna to try to keep it basic and not too full of jargon or scientific language just so everyone can follow. So the talk is, as everyone saw in their email invites and on the advertisements, it's about BPH. BPH stands for benign prostatic hyperplasia. And it's gonna affect almost every man in your life, whether it's your husband, dad, granddad, myself, Daniel, everyone, we're gonna deal with this at some point in our lives. So we're, we're gonna run through the overview of this talk. Obviously, what is BPH? What are my treatment options? And then talk about an exciting new option that's available at Providence, little company, Mary Torrance, called aqua ablation. So if we just look at the basics of BPH, the big question that everyone always asks is what is the prostate and why does it bother me when I'm over 50 years old? Your prostate is really just a sexual organ. It helps to produce and store semen. And as you can see in this little cartoon on the right side of the screen, it sits at the base of your bladder and the bladder is literally pushing urine through the prostate. So you can see in the bottom cartoon, the prostate becomes enlarged. There's less space in between and it's harder for the bladder to push the urine through. Um, you can think of it like peeing through a donut hole. And as men, as we men get older, the donut hole becomes smaller and smaller, requiring more and more work on the bladder's part to empty. BPH is not cancer. You see that underlined here at the bottom of the slide. It's a very important concept because a lot of guys wonder, oh my God, I'm waking up at night four times a night, is it cancer? Almost never is prostate cancer presenting like this. Prostate cancer is screened for with blood tests and physical exams. So don't get nervous, basically and please consult your local friendly neighborhood urologist. So what is BPH? How do I define it as a physician? It's best to split it into two types of symptoms. One, you see on the left-hand side here, ability to hold urine. 
So if you feel like you have to run to the bathroom urgently, if you feel like you're urinating more than the guy next to you in the airplane seat, or if you're waking up at night and your spouse is wondering what the heck's going on, I can't get any sleep either now. Or if you find yourself losing urine and you actually physically can't hold it because you're leaking on yourself, you have a problem holding urine. These are all problems that come with BPH. But also, if you remember the donut hole analogy, emptying the bladder can result in its own type of symptomology as well. So you see all the symptoms on the right-hand side under number two, straining, dysuria, or pain to actually empty your bladder. Hesitancy, meaning you're sitting there waiting for like an extra 10 to 20 seconds, just waiting for the urine to start. Your bladder is literally trying to squeeze and it just can't generate enough power. And then it can also result in a weak stream where you're not impressing anyone at Dodger Stadium when you're taking a bathroom break because the urine is just dribbling out. Intermittency, meaning the urine is a start, stop, start, stop stream. So you're just sitting there pushing, waiting, pushing, waiting. And then worst case scenario, you might find retention where you're holding urine and you can't get it out. It's just stuck. That's a big problem. Um, quality of life factors. A lot of times we will judge the ability to treat BPH or the reason to treat BPH based on quality of life factors. So if you're not sleeping great, it's not going to kill you, but it's really bothersome and it may even be bothering your spouse. Limiting your activities or your choice of activities, if you're not going to go to Dodger Stadium because you don't want to be going to the bathroom every 30 minutes, what's the point of being there? You're not going to go to a baseball game. You're not going to want to go to a movie theater. These are all things we can do again, thankfully, as we're coming out of COVID. But if your bladder and your prostate are not allowing it, that's a big quality of life problem. And then there also can be some indirect relationships to sexual dysfunction, meaning erectile dysfunction or ejaculatory dysfunction. And these all go hand in hand with BPH. So I'm sure someone you know, or someone in the lobby of this talk right now is nodding their heads saying, yep, these are all things I'm dealing with. So the next slide, when you go to your urologist or even your primary care doctor initially, what are we looking to do to diagnose BPH? And honestly, a lot of it will come from the history. You'll tell me the answers to the questions that I was just asking in the prior slide. And I can tell you within the first five minutes if you have BPH or not. But of course, we do need some objective testing and diagnostics, specifically the physical exam of the prostate. Although that's a little bit under, underutilized now, which is the dreaded finger in the butt test, but it does help to give you an, uh, a kind of a quick and dirty estimate of the size of the prostate, how big it really is, and that may correlate into how we treat your BPH um, or the likelihood of certain success, depending on what treatment choice you and I choose as patient and physician. It also will involve the review of your symptoms and then sometimes some medical testing that can like physically evaluate how good of a job you're doing emptying your bladder. Sometimes we'll even need to visualize the prostate by placing a camera. And these are, believe it or not, all things you can do in the office, which makes it really quick, really easy, and also not too painful. Most people don't like the idea of a camera going inside of sensitive areas, but I can guarantee you we do our best to make it as comfortable as possible, adequate numbing medication um, to make it as quick as possible. And honestly, it only takes about 20 to 30 seconds. It is way faster than you think. So you've diagnosed BPH, you've come to your urologist, we've all agreed you got BPH. Of course, the most important reason why you would show up to the doctor, how am I gonna treat this? How am I gonna get this patient better? And it's split pretty easily into three categories. The first one on the left, watchful waiting, then middle medication, last surgery. I think this should be bolded right here and I highlight this with every patient. You're unique, your symptoms are unique, compared to the guy in the waiting room next to you, compared to the guy at work with you. You don't wanna judge your BPH based on what your buddy told you his symptoms are like because everyone's prostates are different sizes and shapes, which obviously results in different symptoms. So this bar you see at the bottom here, in general, 
if your symptoms are worse, you're going to be trending more towards the right medication surgery. Minor symptoms tend to be managed well with watchful waiting. But let's talk about that. What is watchful waiting? Mild symptoms. So you're not up 20 times a night and you're not squeezing for 15 minutes to empty your bladder, but you know, it's like, hey, yeah, I wish I could wake up a little less at night. I wish my stream was a little bit stronger or I wouldn't have to go as often in the daytime. That's what you'd call mild symptoms. We actually have a scoring system called the IPSS score, International Prostate Symptom Score, which colloquially we, return, we term the IPIS score. It's, not a, it's a purposeful acronym. It's not a coincidence. But it basically will give us a number scale that we can score. Do you have mild, moderate, or severe symptoms? The thing is, as you see in this bottom bullet point, prostate continues to grow. And as you get older, you tend to get worse symptoms. So you have to know that too. You might be mild now at 55, but 10 years from now, you might be telling a different story. And well, actually, let me just go back there. So what is watchful waiting? Basically, it's just watch, wait, and see. I can live with these symptoms. Maybe I will drink less water before I go to bed. Maybe I will have less coffee or, you know, won't drink an extra beer before I go to bed. That's kind of the idea behind watchful waiting, stuff that we do as humans, limiting our intake of certain foods and drinks or times that we're eating and drinking to hopefully offset some of these symptoms. A doesn't work for everybody. It tends to have a, a short lifespan because the prostate's only gonna get bigger. So your symptoms are only gonna get worse. They never get better with age. Which brings us to the next most common choice, which is medication. And oftentimes most patients are walking into my door willing and ready to take meds because they're bothered enough to come seek out a urologist. So the uh, medication is for mild to moderate symptoms. And these medications can shrink or relax the prostate. Now, I have strong opinions about the medications that shrink the prostate. I won't get into it all over it right now. It's another Zoom call, but there's a drug called finasteride that will physically shrink your prostate. And everyone thinks that sounds like a great idea. A gland's gonna keep growing till the day I die. Why can't we shrink it? The problem is you look down here on our little asterisk, Finasteride has been linked to many, many, many side effects. And it also works very, very slowly. I'm talking, you take it today, it's not gonna be working till February. And it may not even help you with how you pee. So you might shrink your prostate over six months, deal with loss of libido, erectile dysfunction, ejaculatory dysfunction, meaning less semen production, and you're still not even gonna be peeing better. So it's not a great drug. It does work in a small subset of patients, but it's usually much older men who are trying to avoid surgery. So I don't think shrinking the prostate is really something that is kind of part of the modern treatment for BPH. The relaxation medications, which some of the patients in the, in the lobby right now might recognize is drugs like Flomax or Tamsulosin, Uroxetrol, Alfuzacin, these drugs, are literally relaxing the muscular tissue within the prostate. And remember the prostate is a gland, it produces semen. It has a glandular component where the semen is being produced. It also has a hormonal component uh, as well as a muscular component. So the muscular component is where these medications work, Flomax and Uroxetrol. They are literally relaxing the muscle tissue, hopefully taking some tension out of that donut hole so it can pop open a little bit easier. As you can see here, it only works in 30%, sorry, it fails in 30% of men. So that does mean 70% of men will walk out of my office with a Flomax prescription and say, hey, okay, I'm better. Are you better enough? Could you be better? Those are questions we address as we kind of work through the treatment protocol with BPH. But with anything else in this world, all meds are 
uh, prone to side effects. There's no free lunch. You see the list of side effects down low here, dizziness, headache, fatigue, and then the libido, erectile dysfunction, ejaculatory dysfunction are not all related with the relaxation medications, but specifically ejaculatory dysfunction is a very common side effect as well as dizziness because it can actually interact with blood pressure medications and sometimes make you lightheaded when you get up too quickly. So sometimes you just can't tolerate the side effects or sometimes the meds just don't work. One thing that is true, as we've stated in the slide prior, your prostate will continue to grow and you may literally outgrow the drug, whether it's finasteride or Flomax, whatever it is you might be on, maybe your primary care doctor started it up five years ago, 10 years ago, you will eventually outgrow the drug. It's not perfect and not everyone responds to it, but even the responders will eventually start becoming symptomatic as the medication stops being as effective because your gland is just literally too big now. So you always look for alternates and I can tell you the future of BPH is really not in pharmaceuticals, at least as far as I can see, reviewing the data, reviewing journal articles, reviewing uh, going to meetings, professional society meetings, we're not seeing a lot of new drugs come out there. I think the ability to pharmaceutically treat BPH is probably reached its peak. I don't think we're getting a super flow max or anything like that in the next 10 years. What we're going to see and we're already seeing is just billions of dollars of research and development being put into the surgical treatment aspect. That is the aspect that I think everyone is going to see and kind of be excited about because um, that is where the money is going and that is honestly where the long-term uh, results are being found for most patients. A lot of patients are happier after they get their surgery than they ever were on medication. But let's talk about that. So this is a little bit of a busy slide. I'm gonna do my best to kind of go through each one of these boxes, but it's important to see this covers most of the top five or six surgical treatments for BPH. You'll see here, aquablation is the new up and coming one, which we will talk about. It is not actually up and coming, it's here, but let's talk about what I do when I talk to patients. We talked about the donut hole, analogy, we talked about how it works. Surgery nowadays is not involving incisions in the abdomen. We are not cutting people open anymore. You can still do that. There are large open surgeries or even robotic surgeries where we physically remove the prostate, but that's reserved more for cancer situations. So when you talk to your urologist about surgery for BPH, it's almost always going to be minimally invasive with some sort of camera device inside of the penis. Now, <clears throat> some of those are done in the office. Some of those are done uh, under general anesthesia. I'm sure a lot of you guys are cringing with the idea of a camera being put inside to a sensitive area, but believe it or not, we do a lot of these things in the office and patients walk out the door and they drive themselves home. They may not be excited to have done it for the 10 minutes that they were there, but the results are worth it. So, Non-resective prostate surgery, what does that mean? I think if you look at the history of prostate surgery, what you'll find is prostate surgery has usually revolved around resection. We are trying to literally, um, we're trying to literally core out the prostate, like coring out an apple. And you're trying to make the diameter of the donut hole that a man is peeing through larger and wider. Traditionally, that's been the gold standard. So a lot of times when you Google prostate surgery, you're going to come across T-U-R-P, transurethral resection of prostate. That is a surgery where you're literally like roto rootering that channel. The plumbing is clogged. You know, I am a human plumber and I use this analogy all the time. The plumbing is clogged and we need to unclog it. So if we snake the drain and we can use different techniques to snake the drain, we literally can roto-rooter the channel open. And it traditionally was done in the form of a TURP. 
where a hot knife or a hot uh, loop with electricity running through it would literally carve the tissue in 360 degrees to create a more open, wider diameter channel. And as we progressed, we use laser therapy to do the cutting now, so it's far less bloody and it can be done as a same day surgery. And then you can also go, as I was mentioning, into a more traditional surgery where you make an incision and actually literally pour the prostate out, which we call a simple prostatectomy. This is not a cancer surgery, which is why they call it simple. A radical prostatectomy would make it a cancer surgery. But the simple prostatectomy has now been replaced by uh, minimally invasive robotic surgery. This is the da Vinci surgery that a lot of people know and hear about, but you are doing keyhole surgeries, three or four keyhole incisions and filling the belly up with gas so you can visualize the prostate and core it out. I, that's, the, that's the most invasive this is gonna get. And honestly, most men don't even need to go anywhere near that type of surgery. What's newer is the non-resective prostate surgery. And this is kind of the cutting edge stuff where you can treat a man's prostate without having to cut or vaporize or remove tissue. It's like reshaping the prostate without dramatically changing the anatomy. When we reshape the prostate and core it out in the resective categories here, you'll see the big minus here, high rates of irreversible complications. That's specifically in reference to ejaculation. The semen that the prostate produces fills up into the middle into the donut hole, and then a uh, rhythmic muscle contraction during orgasm will literally squeeze that semen out. After a resective prostate surgery, you actually will lose the ability to close the valve on, on one end, and literally the semen will just dump backwards into your bladder. So you will just have a dry orgasm, and the urine will then mix with the semen, and you'll just pee it out later. So it's uh, a frustrating complication and side effect of the surgery, but it's not life-threatening, but it does bother a lot of men. And in some situations, you can actually get some degree of erectile dysfunction after some of these more aggressive resection type surgeries. But that's where the non-resective surgeries have kind of taken hold. This is usually for smaller prostates and the time to efficacy, because your prostate is still there, no matter which one of these two choices you're making, you still have your prostate, it will regrow. Your prostate grows till the day you die, even if you core it out, even if you cook it, even if you put staples in it, it will continue to grow. So the long-term relief aspect has always been uh, the, the kind of goal. The TURP had a kind of a gold standard of 10 years of efficacy, and everyone's chasing that 10-year rate of efficacy. The non-resective procedures are approaching the 10 years, but they don't have the length of data to say that, hey, we're just as good. So they're very promising studies for five years and up to 10 years, but you're looking at 30 years history of one surgery being done compared to 10 years at most for some of these newer options. So I think they are here to stay and they are going to play a role in BPH therapy for a long, long time, but it's not for everybody. And that's where your urologist really was going to help guide you. You have so many choices and you're going to be bombarded with all these choices on Facebook, Instagram, your buddies, your friends, your family. You always have to remember what we mentioned in the earlier slide. You have to gear prostate therapy for the patient in front of you. This is not a textbook. This is not an algorithm. This is real life. So every man has their own set of symptoms. Every man has their own quality of life issues. Every man has their own size and shape of the prostate. But these are the general ideas of the ways I look at a guy's prostate. Which one of these is going to treat him the best? And that's ultimately where I would make a recommendation. Now, after talking all about this and, and saying that, well, this resective surgery has irreversible complications, non-resective prostate surgery has lower rates of irreversible complications. Uh, just I should note, prostatic urethral lift is actually the Euro lift 
which is probably something people are hearing and reading about. The water vapor is the resume procedure, which people are hearing a lot about and reading about. That's This is just kind of what Medicare terminal, uh, terminology would state for these type of surgeries because they don't put the brand name there. But that's what these are in reference to, Euro lift and resume. Now, the it brings us to kind of the consideration of where does aquablation fall into this, which I'll get into, but let me just wrap up on the surgery idea as I was mentioning. We're treating each patient individually. And if you go see a doc, you go see a urologist and they say, well, this is the one choice that I think is gonna work best for you. They may not be completely accurate. There's almost always multiple choices, but you have to offer the patient a slew of choices and everything has their pros and cons. You can see the pluses and minuses right here. And you can have different pluses and different minuses, different pros, different cons for each patient. Some patients are very uh, protective of their sexual function and they don't want anything to happen. And there are some older patients who are like, doc, I don't care about my sex life. I just don't want to live with a urinary catheter in my penis. Get rid of it. Give me the best option to get rid of it. So these are the things that go through my head when I'm talking to patients and trying to decide what's the best idea or what's the best opportunity to offer. Which brings us to aquablation. This is arguably one of the newer, more advanced options for prostate surgery. It does fall under the resective prostate surgery category, but it's unique in its own right, which is why it gets its own box. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide. And, you know, got a little happy guy here. He had a great aqua ablation. So what is aqua ablation? We, first of all, have this at Providence, Little Company, Mary Torrance. I myself performed uh, the first one here at the hospital in December of 2021 and have been doing at least three to five of these procedures a month. And almost 99% of my patients are extremely happy. But why did I bring it into my practice? And I think the bullet points here on the left are a good kind of recap of what exactly the surgery is. So first of all, it's robotic. Now it's not like the Da Vinci robotic, but the idea is a robot can do repetitive tasks if it's pre-programmed to do them at a much higher rate and faster rate with much more efficiency than a human hand can. Now, under my eye, I know what I want this prostate to look like when I'm done with the surgery. So aquablation basically combines surgeon's experience, our eyes, the patient's anatomy assessed in 3D, uh, 3D live ultrasound, and then a robotic arm to carry out the tasks in a very, very fast manner. It would probably take me an hour to do the same amount of work that the aquablation prod, uh, a platform can allow me to do the same work in four minutes, maybe five minutes. So it is resection. We are vaporizing tissue, but we are using a high pressure water beam. So there is no heat applied and the water beam is controlled by a robotic arm. But the program of where this robotic arm shoots and for how long and how deep, that is all preset by myself as a surgeon using live real-time ultrasound evaluation of the prostate. So we are precise, we are consistent, and we can predict the results. And the other thing that's nice, the prostate size can be small, like 30 to 40 cc's. We measure prostates in cc's. Uh, and then a large gland would be over 150 cc's, but it doesn't matter. Aquablation can treat all comers. And the other thing that's very nice, we were talking about irreversible complications, the complication of ejaculatory dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, it is due to the nonspecific reshaping of the prostate. We know where prostate ejaculatory ducts are. We know what the prostate should look like. But when we start cutting it, we're just cutting it in a circle. We know the prostate is not really a circle. It's more like an ellipse. And how can we maintain the natural anatomy if we can't see the entire gland? But guess what? Aquablation gives us real-time evaluation of the entire gland while we're treating. So we are literally, we're kind of drawing in between the lines. We are keeping our lines of treatment in between the lines of anatomy so we can actually maintain ejaculatory function 
in most men. You know, it, it's a, there's a potentially two to three percent rate of ejaculatory dysfunction in the biggest data sets with doc ablation, but that's still better than 30 to 40 percent ejaculatory dysfunction in a traditional TURP. So significantly lower complication rate because we are literally marking where all the important anatomical landmarks are and we're protecting them the entire time. And the robotic arm has been told, do not cut past here, you know, don't pass go, so to speak. So the risk of incontinence or irreversible ejaculatory dysfunction is significantly lower than traditional resection procedures. And the heat that's applied in the traditional surgeries with lasers or hot electrical coils, we do assess that some of the erectile function dysfunction that occurs can be due to the heat. The energy is transferring to the nerves outside the prostate, which are the nerves that supply the penis for erections. So we are doing this with no heat. It's just high pressure water. So the lack of energy transfer is also very valuable in recovery, as well as lack of transmission to surrounding structures such as nerves. There is a little video here. Uh, you guys can YouTube this. Uh, it's very readily available from the company. Uh, Procept is the company that makes this. I'm not gonna go through the video, but as I was mentioning, we're using a camera to real time visualize the prostate. We're using an ultrasound in real time to visualize and assess prostate size and shape. And it allows us to protect and avoid sensitive areas that lead to complications. So why would I choose aquablation over anything else? I think I've kind of chosen this, or I, I think I've kind of assessed this already, but complications are low. Confidence of procedure. I mean, we're looking at five-year data. The original studies were done dating back to almost 10 years, but uh, between South Asia and Europe and now America, we have a very wide spectrum of multiple different types of patients that have been treated with aquablation across the world with excellent outcomes and excellent long-term results. Now, of course, it doesn't have 30 years of data and it won't because it's only been out for really three years, three to four years, really ready to be consumed by the general public. So we know with the data in the experimental stages that it's been very successful and those patients are still doing well and they're almost approaching 10 years out. As far as recovery, it's not too dissimilar to a other, any other type of resection procedure. When you resect the prostate tissue in any fashion, there's always a minor risk of bleeding or oozing and blood clots. So a catheter is left inside the urethra, out the tip of the penis and draining your urine constantly. The catheter itself acts as almost like a tamponade. It's like a finger on the bleeder. It's putting pressure inside of this recently operated prostate to keep it from oozing and keep it from bleeding. And then that pressure is applied with the catheter. And then the catheter is usually able to be removed the next day because with the high pressure water, there's no heat, there's very little scabbing, very little scarring. So there's very quick recovery time. Now, of course, you had a scope and a camera as well as a catheter inside of your penis for a 24 hour period, you're gonna be sore. You're going to burn a little bit when you pee. You might see some frequency and urgency as the body heals. But when you're home, you're home. You can eat, you can drink, be merry, walk up and down stairs. Usually recommend you avoid heavy, heavy lifting or heavy, heavy activity. But in general, uh, you can return to your normal life pretty quickly. And that is pretty much what I got here for my portion of the talk. I don't want to take up too much of your time and bore you guys with PowerPoints, but I would love to open it up for questions. Uh, and I think Daniel can kind of help us uh, uh, help us moderate that, but that's what I got. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for an interesting and very informative presentation. Um, I'm always relieved to uh, be reminded that BPH is not linked to prostate cancer. For some reason, I continue to make that connection, but um, that's always uh, you know, good information to have um, at the forefront. Uh, begin, before we begin our Q&A, we have a few questions for you. 
If you could please answer the poll that you see appear on the screen and give us your honest feedback, we would greatly appreciate it. And now we will go ahead and begin our Q&A. Feel free to continue to ask questions in the Q&A box and we will do our best to get to them. All right, let's start. Okay, for how long is the no lifting in place post-surgery? Uh, it depends on what uh, surgery you're talking about. So if we're talking about aqua ablation, usually I recommend no more than 25 pounds for the first two to three weeks after that surgery. If you're doing the non-resective options like Euro lift or resume, you, you can do whatever you want basically within 48 hours. There's a lot less restrictions uh, on the non-resective options. Great. Is aquablation covered by Medicare? Yes, it is. That's one of the reasons why it's really only taken off in the last two to three years because you know, if no one's gonna pay for it, it's hard to actually do the procedure. In, in America, at least, once Medicare approves something and a hospital and a, and a surgical team knows that they're gonna get paid for the procedure, that's when you really see it take off. So that, that's definitely covered by Medicare. I've had zero problems getting it uh, approved, even by commercial payers. Uh, as well as HMO plans. This is, it's probably going to become one of the standard of care options for large prostates. And I don't think you're going to have to have much of a struggle in getting it approved. Hey, thank you. Next question. I am a 67 year old male that has had to get up once per night to urinate, rarely twice if I drink a lot of liquids. Since my urine flow is good, my doctor has me on watchful waiting. However, if my bladder is full, I can have an urgent need to evacuate my bladder. I have read that Tylenol can reduce these urges. What do you recommend for mild cases? Are there any dietary suggestions other than not drinking too much, especially on an empty stomach? Are there any exercises that may help? So watchful waiting is, it's a, it's a broad or wide umbrella. I think most people and your physician probably told you about not drinking before nighttime, but there are certain dietary triggers that we do know uh, or irritants, specifically caffeine, alcohol, the higher proof alcohols would definitely be worse, um, acidic foods or juices, and, you know, just, you know, anything that's not super healthy for you, most likely. So, you know, your flaming Hot Cheetos, it's probably going to make you pee more. But I think we all know Flamin' Hots are not a food group that we should be doing a lot of. But, you know, all the inorganic and kind of junk food that we have out there, it's undoubtedly going to make your symptoms worse. When you're looking at watchful waiting, the cleaner your diet, the more likely, uh, more successful it's going to be as far as exercises. People talk about Kegels exercises all the time, pelvic floor exercises. It's very hard for men and women to do it on their own. But I think you know, you can be taught. There's great YouTube videos. And then we also work with great pelvic floor physical therapists in the area that can help teach you how to do those exercises. And those can sometimes offset that, the strong urge to go run to the bathroom if you're trying to avoid taking medication or anything like that. Great, thank you. Is there a difference between, oh, I'm sorry, skipped. Wait, is there a difference between laser ablation and aquablation? Yeah, so... Laser ablation usually done with a green light. Uh, it's literally a green light laser. Laser ablation is, I mean, physically they're the same idea. They're all resective, but the laser is manually controlled by myself, the surgeon. So remember how I was referring to the efficiency of the human hand versus a robotic arm that's been pre-programmed to do something. A laser prostatectomy or a green light laser photo vaporization of the prostate is also known as a PVP. That will take you about 60 to 90 minutes. And that's physically the, the surgeon sitting there twirling the laser, vaporizing tissue, vaporizing tissue, vaporizing tissue. That 60 to 90 minutes of working time, I can do with aquablation in literally minutes. And I can do it the same way every single time. I, the depth of tissue, the amount of tissue removed, is controlled, it's objective. There's a lot of subjectivity to traditional resection surgeries because, you know, it, it looks okay. Yeah, it looks good enough. That's, kind of, you know, that's like, like the old joke back in the day when urologists were talking to each other, that looks pretty open. 
but what does that mean? It, there's, that's not very objective. So this alkylation is a subjective, it, it, there's no subjectivity. You know you're open, you know you've resected a good amount of tissue because you've seen it go away. Very good, thank you. Uh, what is the risk of bladder neck contracture? Bladder neck contracture, if, it, if the question's in relation to aquablation, very low. We do believe a bladder neck contracture occurred in traditional terps uh, and traditional resection options because of the energy, the heat, and you're cooking the tissue at the same time that you're vaporizing and the cooking will sometimes devascularize, which is why we scar. And if there's no blood flow, you will scar. So aquablation, remember, has zero energy transfer. So the bladder neck contracture rate is extremely, extremely low. It's 1% in the, 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 the big studies were called water, water one, water two, less than 1% stricture rate or bladder neck contracture rate in those studies. And I, I think it clearly, the lack of energy transfer is the big difference. Great, right, thank you. If you've had, if you've already had Eurolift and BPH continues, is aquablation able to be performed? Great question. Uh, I do a lot of Eurolift as well. And I would be lying to you if I said every single patient I ever Euro lifted was 99% happier than before. Every guy's prostate's different. Symptoms are different. It's always a discussion. Sometimes the, the right choice is not the choice that we make initially. And sometimes the prostate changes and Euro lift sometimes works for a few years. And then you look back in there and you're like, oh my God, there's a lot of tissue still in there. You 100% can do aqua ablation if you've had Eurolift before. It doesn't change anything. The thing I like about Eurolift is no bridges are burned. When you do a Eurolift, you haven't taken choices off the table for the patient either a week from now or 10 years from now. So you have not burned any bridges. If you have Eurolift in there, you definitely are still a candidate for aquablation. Great. Um, can you talk about the effectiveness of a PSA test? <laughs> it's a loaded question. Um, PSA is prostate specific antigen. It's designed to be a prostate cancer screening study. It's the best prostate cancer screening study we have, but it's also a pretty junk study. You know, statistically speaking, it's maybe only 30% accurate in predicting prostate cancer. We know it's much more accurate when, when you do it sub successively. So if you're doing it yearly and I look at 10 years of PSA history in a patient, I can give you a pretty good thought. Do you, are you going to get prostate cancer or not? If I get a one P, first time PSA in a 45 year old guy, that doesn't tell me anything. I really need to see a trend. So I can say PSA is not the most effective one time study, but it does have its uses when it's used as a yearly screening study. Right. Can you speak a little bit about the Eurolift procedure upside downside of it? You mean, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you mean downsides of that, but Daniel, is that what that means? If there's any upsides or downsides. Okay, so yeah. Eurolift upside is it's quick. It can be done in the office. You don't need to have a catheter afterwards. It can be done in the hospital or the office. It, it takes seven to 10 minutes maximum. And it's quick return to activity, quick return to normalcy, and quick improvement in your symptoms. The downside, honestly, to Eurolift is sometimes it just doesn't work good enough. Sometimes your symptom response is not good enough. Hard to predict initially, but you know when I offer Eurolift to my patients, I'm usually hoping for a 40 to 50% reduction in their overall symptoms. And I'm promising them or hoping to promise them up to seven years of relief based on the largest data studies that are out there. Not everyone makes it to seven years and not everyone gets enough symptom relief. But I think the only real downside to Eurolift is you may not be as happy as you think afterwards. It may not be as effective. All right, thank you. Um, do you go off of the drugs that you mentioned um, after surgery? Yeah, if you're going down the surgical route, the goal would be, I mean, you should only be, but the, it's not always the case. I've seen patients who are still on drugs after having TERPs, but you should be coming off of medication when you choose to go down the road of surgery. Surgery should be replacing and improving upon any medications you may have been taking. Thank you. Are there any foods or medications that help enlarge the prostate? Help enlarge it? No. 
help shrink it? Also no. But as mentioned before, there's a lot of irritants out there that can make your prostate symptoms worse. It's not because it's making it grow, but just putting more irritants into your urine, or which are then going to irritate a larger prostate, which are going to result in more symptoms. Once again, caffeine, spicy foods, alcohol, uh, acidic foods and drinks. Those kind of things are irritants more than they are going to cause enlargement. I have Medi-Cal LA care. Do these cover ablation? It depends on the actual servicer. So if you have an HMO through LA care, I can say yes, they do. But uh, your networks can be restrictive a little bit. So it depends on if you have a urologist in LA care network that provides the service to you. Uh, that one I can't speak to, but I do know LA care does cover it. Okay, what is the impact of surgery, including aquablation, on dribble at the end of urinating? So dribble at the end of urination would be considered one of the emptying side of the symptoms. So the reason you're usually dribbling is because the bladder just can't squeeze everything out very efficiently. So if you have surgery and you open the channel up and you have a wider channel and it's easier for your bladder to empty, you almost always will improve the, the leaky faucet syndrome or dribbling at the end because your bladder has worked more efficiently to empty itself and not leaving anything behind to dribble. So it does a very good job. Surgery usually does a very good job to treat that, that particular symptom. Okay. I think these questions from the same person, so hopefully I ask them in the correct order. Um, had blood in my urine and subsequent, subsequent clots, what caused the bleeding? Great question. We'd have to put a camera inside to see a lot of different things. Blood in the urine can be coming from your kidneys. It could be coming from your bladder. It could be coming from your prostate. It could be coming from your urethra. You have to get a camera done at your urologist's office to figure that answer out. Thank you. How do you direct the high pressure water towards the walls or towards bladder? So the robotic arm has been pre-programmed uh, in 270 degrees of working uh, vision to literally direct this, the water sprayer. It's like a high pressure water nozzle. So it's being directed by the robotic arm. And we've told it how deep to go and what direction to go for the entire duration of the therapy. Thank you. What are the recommended painkillers after aquablation? Good question. You know, in general, surgery. Uh, for the prostate, we are moving away from narcotics. Obviously, I'm sure everyone's aware there's an opioid uh, pandemic or epidemic, however you want to describe it. So in general, we're moving away from narcotic therapy. And honestly, I'm just giving Tylenol and ibuprofen for my patients after aquablation or even laser prostate surgery. Narcotics will stop you up. It'll constipate you. It'll slow the bladder down, not to mention the GI symptoms, upset stomach, headache. A lot of side effects for not a lot of effect. When you have prostate and bladder surgery, usually you're having spasms of the bladder and burning when urinating. And guess what? Narcotics don't help with any of those. So we're usually doing Tylenol, ibuprofen for generalized discomfort and soreness, and then urinary anesthetics like over-the-counter azo or also known as pyridium. You spoke about all options remain on the table after your older procedure. Would you make the same statement about aquablation? Yeah, I would not. Good question. You know, anything that involves resection, you are now in a different ball game. So once you've cut the prostate, whether it's reshaping more traditionally with TERP and lasers versus more kind of high tech, modern technology with aquablation, once you've cut prostate tissue, you're in a different ball game. Yeah, I guess five years from now, after an aquablation, you could do a urolift, but it, the anatomy for the prostate has now changed permanently. So it's impossible to predict if you could do a urolift or a resume on someone who had a TERP or a laser TERP or a aquablation five years ago. You'd have to put a camera inside in the office to diagnose the type of blockage to be able to answer that question. Thank you. Can letting BPH go too long harm the bladder? Yes, definitely. So one of the problems with BPH 
although I kind of highlighted quality of life issues on the, the symptom discussion, you do have some true medical emergencies that come from BPH. If you can't pee at all, it's very unhealthy for your body, but specifically your kidneys. You also can make stones. You also can get urinary tract infections. And you also can get kidney, uh, I know I mentioned kidney dysfunction, but if you're getting those kind of medical problems, you really should be getting your BPH treated. It's not a symptom or quality of life issue anymore. So yeah, the BPH that's gone unchecked for many years can lead to significant medical coverage. Thank you. Um, should we expect a primary doctor to conduct a physical exam at an annual physical? Some no longer offer it. Uh, the DRE or digital rectal exam or physical exam, finger in the butt, it's not nearly as often done. Primary care docs just don't like doing it anymore for obvious reasons. I mean, no one likes the idea of it. No one wants to do it. No one wants to receive it. I, I think the, the utility of it's becoming less when it comes to assessing the prostate size. It still has some value when assessing the prostate quality. If your prostate's hard and nodular, it's a little bit more of a concern for a cancer. But just assessing if it's big or not, having, you know, everyone's finger is a different length and some people are just more uncomfortable getting it done or, or doing it. It's a very, very subjective study. So I don't think you should expect your primary care doc to do it. Truthfully speaking, you probably shouldn't expect your urologist to do it anymore either because we'll be assessing your prostate in much more objective ways, ultrasound, cameras, imaging, before relying just on our finger now. Definitely good to know. <laughs> uh, how is bleeding controlled after tissue is resected through aquablation? Are bleeders cauterized? Correct. So we are vaporizing the tissue, but around the bladder neck where there's a lot of blood flow, we will then cauterize very focally in a 360 degree fashion, the bladder neck. And that basically is it. So the cautery after the true aquablation is done can take anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes, but we're just concentrating on the bladder neck portion of the prostate and leaving the rest of the gland alone. And that's where the catheter staying in overnight is helpful because remember that does the tamponade or finger on the bleeder effect overnight. Thank you. What causes urinary urge if there is little liquid in the bladder? It's a deconditioning of your bladder. You can think of it as your bladder is a muscle and over the years, BPH makes your bladder squeeze harder and harder to empty. And then the tension within the muscle of the bladder gets higher and higher. So that baseline tension can oftentimes result in spasms and your bladder doesn't like to hold as much urine because it's under so much tension a small amount of urine will set the bladder muscle off compared to 10 times as much when you were 25 years old, setting off the same type of signal in your head that, oh my God, I'm super full, I gotta run. It's just deconditioning of the bladder over years and years of overworking a muscle. That, that's why you have the urge and not a lot coming out. Okay, thank you. Well, I still need to take, is it hytrine or hytrine after aquablation? Hytrin is a older version of medical therapy uh, for uh, prostate enlargement, similar to Flomax. It's about two generations older than Flomax. And the answer is no. If you have a, a successful aquablation, you should not require Hytrin afterwards. Great. Um, please expand on the IPSS score. Sure. So IPSS score oftentimes will be handed to you by your urologist in the waiting room or it will be assessed by just the general symptom questioning that we do when we do our history taking. But it, it'll ask you a few questions about the strength of your stream, how frequently you're, you're voiding, and each of these questions is scored. And then that score is added up at the end of the questionnaire and it'll range anywhere from zero to 35 points. And the higher the number, the more severe your symptoms. So you can actually download an IPSS score off of, uh, off of Mayo Clinic or UCLA Urology website. You can take the score yourself and see the closer you are to 35, the worse shape you are as far as your quality of life and your ability to empty. Thank you. Um, any problems drinking lemon juice? Well, if you do too much of it, you know, lemon's pretty citricky. 
Uh, it's very acidic. I, there's a lot of people like lemon for multiple health reasons right now. There's nothing wrong with it. You just got to temper and, and you know, contextually not do too much of it. Thank you. I believe that's all the questions. We have another minute or two. We'll see if anyone has additional questions. Okay, so then let me go, go through these scans or go through these questions here too, Daniel. Someone asked how long the surgery takes. Um, the surgery, so altogether, you'd probably be asleep for uh, about an hour altogether, but the actual operating time is more like 30 minutes. Answer that one. So someone asked, how long does Eurolift take? Eurolift can take anywhere between seven to 10 minutes. And um, someone asked how we can contact you. I think my contact information will be available to you guys. It might be even emailed to you guys, but it's definitely available on the Providence website. Uh, Daniel, is that accurate? Are we sending something out to everyone in the meeting as far as contacting? I believe we are, but we can follow up make sure they, okay. they have some way of getting in contact sure. with you. Um, so okay. we have time for one more question if there's any additional questions. There's one I want to stop taking the high trend because I need cataract surgery. Oh floppy yeah, iris comp okay. Yeah, well, yeah, so floppy iris, your ophthalmologist doesn't like Tamsulosin or Flomax because it, it causes something called floppy iris syndrome. Don't ask me to explain it. I'm not an ophthalmologist, but I do know that eye surgeons really do not like Hytrin, Flomax, and these type of medications because it makes their jobs harder when they do cataract surgery. Another reason why it might be beneficial to get off medication in a lot of situations because it may make your eye surgery tougher in the future. Great, thank you. Well, at 6.30, um... Dr. Ahmed, thank you very much for your expertise and, and your way of presenting information in a way that um, is relaxing and not doesn't scare too many people. So we, we all appreciate that. No problem. Um, thank you all. Uh, thank you to all, all of you for taking the time to listen and ask questions. A big thank you, Dr. Ahmed, as I stated, for taking the time to provide us with the valuable information. We will be sending a recording of the presentation to all attendees for you to have. That's it. That answers that question. We'll also have the posting of this. We will also be posting this on our Facebook page for everyone to be able to view and share. You can find this at Little Company Mary South Bay on Facebook. For any additional information or to schedule a physician's appointment, please call our Patient Engagement Center at 844-925-0942. That's 844-925-0942. Thank you again and have a great rest of your evening. Take care.